This morning is going to be a little bit different. We have two scriptures that we're going through, and the first is from Psalm 84, and we're going to read it together as a call and response. So that should be in the bulletins and on the screens, and I'll go ahead and read the first line. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs and do O Lord of hosts, my ruler and my God, at your altars even the sparrow finds a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young. Blessed are those who dwell in your house, ever singing your praise. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, in whose hearts are the highways to Zion. As they go through the valley of tears, they may get a place They go from strength to strength. The God of gods will be seen in Zion. The Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. Behold our shield, O God. Look on the face of your anointed. For a day in your courts is, is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of God For the Lord God is a sun and shield, and bestows favor and honor. No good thing does the Lord withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed are those who trust in you. Our second scripture reading comes from the New Testament, Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 25. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain that is through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us approach with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for letting me be here with you in worship this morning. It's uh, a privilege to, to get to preach. I uh, promised the choir that I'd been saving up all my sermons over the past few weeks so that they would get uh, the longest sermon for their money. Yeah. So. <laughs> No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but friends, I would invite us to uh, take a deep breath and go to the Lord in a moment of prayer as we prepare to hear what he has to say to us today. Almighty God, we give you thanks for drawing us into worship this morning, for the breath that you've placed in our lungs to praise you, uh, for the gifts that you've bestowed on each and every person who's here, the gifts of music that are in this place of of serving as acolytes, as serving as greeters, as serving as ushers, as uh, sitting with loved ones in pews and paying uh, honor to God with your presence. Lord, we, we thank you for all of this and for the privilege that it is to gather in your son's name. Lord, be now with the one who preaches, for his sins are many and they are known unto you, Lord. Uh, Speak through me and in spite of me. Be with this congregation gathered here in person and online for the ones who seek your face and seek your will in their lives. And Lord, make everything clear to us as you would seek uh, to move in and around us this morning in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. 
So I am blessed to be with you, uh, and I'm especially blessed to be in the middle of this sermon series that we've started on the membership vows of the United Methodist Church uh, called Living Faith. The membership vows in the UMC include promising to faithfully participate in the life of the church through our prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness. And there's a cheat sheet here with you on the front of the bulletin if you need um, I should have said that um, if you need to remember those. But I love that we're doing this as a sermon series because these are our vows that we make when we join the church or when we're baptized. And as followers of Christ, uh, we take our word pretty seriously, right? Christians are supposed to be honest so that when we pledge to do something, that's what a vow is, that we want to live into it. Uh, We want to take this very seriously. So much like the vows that one might make uh, in marriage, it's good to revisit these vows to ask ourselves, am I living into these? Am I living up to these? So today I'm tasked with preaching on the second of these uh, vows, which is on the topic of presence. So uh, Merriam-Webster's dictionary defines presence as a gift given formally or bestowed, especially during a celebration such as a birthday or Christmas. Oh my gosh, that can't be right. That's presence with T-S. I'm so embarrassed. Oh, my wife told me that joke was too corny to, to say today. I can, see, I can see that she was right. Uh, so... Um, presence, not the ones that you get under the tree. Presence are, are being here. That's what it means. What does presence mean uh, in the local church? Well, simply put, presence means showing up. Showing up. It is as simple and as complicated as that. Sermon over. <laughs> well, just kidding. You will get your money's worth. Okay. Uh, But it is as simple, as complicated as that. Sometimes uh, going to church and being present with the body of Christ can be the easiest thing in the world. You roll out of bed and you're like, I'm super excited to be at church today. I'll get to see my friends. I get to eat donuts. Other times, it might be more difficult. Uh, Maybe you really could have used that extra hour or so of sleep. But we promise to be present here for our church's ministries. Not merely on Sunday morning like we are right now, but also throughout the week. Throughout the the weeks and months and years of our lives. And and we promise that our fellowship in the church will be a a priority for us in in our lives. Um, Can you hear me now? Sorry. Thanks. Uh, And we promise that our presence will be a priority in our lives because we value the communal life of discipleship. We value the communal life of discipleship. It means showing up when you're jazzed and excited to hear what the Lord has to say to you. That's what presence means. But it also equally means showing up when you stayed up too late, maybe watching college football, or you stayed out at a dinner party a little too late, and you would rather you know, wake up at 11 a.m. instead of 11 a.m. for church, and maybe hit up a late brunch, and then, hey, you can check out the church service later, but then it gets to Tuesday, and you still haven't watched it, and you're like, well, man, I'll just wait for the next one. <laughs> it means showing up in both of those circumstances for God. And presence is important to our our life of faith, our life as individual Christians and as a body, not out of some sense of strict legalism or uh, to get a gold star from Pastor Grayson. Um, You could ask her for one. Or because God cares if we have a perfect church attendance record. The reason that we pledge to be uh, faithful with our presence is not for any of these reasons. Instead, it's because we know that that Jesus has called us to a life of holiness. Amen? Amen. Jesus has called us to a life of holiness. That means a life of growth in grace. And we can't live that life alone. We can't live that life alone. The Apostle Peter tells us as much when he writes in 1 Peter 1, 13-16, Therefore, prepare your minds for action. 
Discipline yourselves. Set all your hope on the grace that Jesus Christ will bring you when he is revealed. Like obedient children, do not be conformed to the desires you formerly had in ignorance. Instead, as he who called you is holy, be holy yourselves in all your conduct. For it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. So we hear from Peter, God wants us to grow he wants us to grow in holiness and be shaped. And if Peter is not a good enough uh, citation for you, what about that, uh, that fellow of the Son of God? Jesus, he said the same thing. Matthew 5, 48. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. So if Peter weren't good enough for you, Jesus said that one. <laughs> Jesus expects us to grow. And, and both of them are repeating this message that we've heard from God since the very beginning of Scripture that we heard in the book of Leviticus. Be holy as I am holy. This message from God that I, your heavenly Father, want to see your life transformed. Want to see your life transformed. I want to see you, you reflect me to the world. And we know as, as Christians on the other side of, of the crucifixion, on the other side of the resurrection, that the way that God has ordained for this to happen is through the people called the body of Christ, through the church. And that, that's the same throughout the world in rundown shacks in Africa and in underground house churches in China where the religion is illegal and in uh, pretty nice uh, old sanctuaries in, in North Raleigh, mm -hmm. that the same way of being and growing has been uh, established by God. That it's not the place, it's the people to which God has trusted the process of making saints. Presence is about making saints. So we must be present with one another in the body as the body, to grow, to be holy. We know that God has called us out from every corner of the earth. There are people here from different backgrounds and places, but God has called each and every one of us out of sin, out of death, out of the former ways of being into new life, to be configured to the Jesus way. And we know that we cannot experience this life of transformation on our lonesome, can we? You can't do it on your own, can you? Maybe I'm being presumptuous. I can't do it on my own. Yeah. Amen. Thank you. <laughs> we can't do it on our own. Now, I would understand, though, if at first blush you, you kind of cringe at this idea or want to push back on it because it's not an idea that fits neatly in our modern culture. We uh, live in a hyper-individualistic society, yeah? A society that says that you get to set your own agenda. You get to schedule your life. You get to go where you want, when you want, be with who you want to be, eat what you want to eat, spend time with who you want to spend it with. More now than ever has been in the case of all human history, we have freedom of a sort to do what we think we ought to do. But the message of the gospel is, is drastically different from this. It, it is that true freedom, true calling, is that God has called us out of the world and given us a task, given us a place to be and a thing to do. We learn that God has called us out from the world and ultimately that our lives are not our own. Your life is not your own. Your life is not your own. Our lives belong instead to God, to Jesus. And I, I can't remember who said it is that you, you only gain your life by losing it. Who said that? Jesus. Je thank you, choir. Jesus said that. <laughs> That's what we learn is you only gain your life by losing it. And presence in the church is about all of us getting lost together so that we might be found together. Amen? Amen. I want to turn now to this, uh, this section from the book of Hebrews um, 
as we read it today and as I was reading it through the week, it left me with a question. This phrase about how we are to provoke one another to acts of love and kindness, uh, love and good deeds. And my question was, how can we do this if we don't live a life of presence together? Is it possible? No, I don't think so. We, we can't live a life together apart. We wouldn't accept this kind of logic in any other facet of life, but when it comes to, to faith and religion, sometimes people think they can be a lone wolf. My faith is my own. You hear people say that? That's not the case for, for Christians. Your faith uh, is a faith that was passed on to you, inherited. It's our inheritance. Some of you may have got an inheritance from your parents. You got a necklace or you got a plot of land to farm on. But the greatest inheritance you were ever given, and it might have not even come from your biological family, was the faith given to you. And so we know that we can't do it on our own. We can't live it on our own. You cannot be a Christian uh, without the church any more than you could be, say, a jazz drummer without your jazz band. So imagine this, you're a jazz drummer. You can study your passion at home. You can, you can learn music theory, practice all your rhythms, set up a metronome. You can set up a melody track in your ears and uh, get out your practice pad and annoy the bejesus out of your neighbors. Um, you can do all of this. But until you go to band practice and work out these tunes, whether they're standard tunes or whatever, you don't know if it's going to mesh. Uh, John, what would it sound like if the choir did not rehearse? John says a little subpar. <laughs> choir, is John being generous there? Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think he's being generous. We have to join our voices and talents together. The same thing is true in music as it is in sports, as it is in anything. You have to join together to realize the vision. You have to join together to realize the vision. And the vision of holiness for the church is not a bunch of really good individuals. It's a holy church. Can you have individual practices like you would as a musician? Go home, go to the, the, the rehearsal space or, or lock yourself in your closet and play through music. Can you refine your pursuits in a walk with Christ? Absolutely. You should. You should have individual pursuits. You should read the scriptures. You should pray. You should uh, devote yourself to God. But is that sufficient for it all? What happens when you're struck by a crisis of faith, when you endure something you never thought that you could endure? You, in those moments, are drawn to call on a friend. Maybe it's someone from uh, your Sunday school or your choir, or maybe it's that uh, person from your Methodist women's circle. You have to call on the body of the Christ, and to do that, you must be present with them. And that, the same thing, if you're going through Scripture and you're reading on your own, as I encourage everyone to do, what happens when you come across a difficult passage in the, in the Scriptures that's been challenging you? you? You don't know where to go. you got to call up Pastor Grayson and say, I need your help. Can you do some research with this on me? Can you, can you work through this? Or another trusted friend, right? You wouldn't just say, well, I guess I'm never going to understand this. At least I hope you wouldn't. If you get stuck on something, call Pastor Grayson. That's what I'm telling you today. If you don't get anything else. And the underlying message to all of that, I'm, I'm, I'm being serious here, is we are made for each other. We are made for each other. We, we read in, in the scriptures that God made us for himself to delight in us. But we also know that God delights in us not just as a bunch of individuals he created, but as his creation, loving and working and moving together. God called out a people. The people was called Israel. God called out a people. The people was called Christ. And that 
That's us. That's all those who claim Christ throughout the world this morning. We're made for each other. The body of Christ is about this work of provoking one another toward holiness, to become a new creation, to be that which God intends us to be. Does anybody here think that they're a finished product? I'm not going to assume anything. I'm going to turn around and get the full. Nobody here is a finished product. God is bringing us to holiness to prepare us for that day that the author of Hebrews says is approaching. And so do not neglect to meet. Even when you might be frustrated with church, even when you might be annoyed by your neighbor, even when you don't like the songs that we're singing or 11 a.m. comes sooner than it usually does. Anybody ever have that happen? They say it's at the same time every day, but it doesn't seem, it seems that it moves to me anyway. Because our presence in the church, our, our being here, our showing up is not just for ourselves. I've tried to tell you that you need to be in church because God is trying to make you holy. The second part of this is you need to be in church because God is trying to make the person across the aisle from you holy. Mm-hmm. Yeah? Yes. Our presence in the church is not just for our own satisfaction. But being present in the church is about offering yourself as a fragrant offering to see what God can do with you to be a beautiful scent to the world, to draw others to the love of God. And you can't do that as a one-man band. You can be the best jazz drummer in the world, but I promise you, if you don't have at least a couple other people up there with you on the stage, you're not going to sell many tickets. Now, I want to turn to a, a popular saying that, uh, that I've heard, and maybe some of you have heard it too. It says, going to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than standing in a garage makes you a car. Anybody heard that? <laughs> it's funny, you know, and certainly it has a ring of truth to it, um, calling out hypocrisy, that is. But I don't think it makes the point that people quite think that it makes. Sure, being a church member, having a butt in the pew, is no guarantee that you have accepted faith in Christ and that you felt uh, your sins washed away. But it is also equally true that your chances of coming to a living faith in Christ are drastically increased if you are walking on that same road toward God with your fellow brothers and sisters, your fellow pilgrims in the pews. Amen? If you are on that road with others, do you think you stand a better chance of making it on your own or a better chance if you can look across and see someone who is a few years ahead of you in the faith and learn from their mistakes and their trials or that you could walk beside someone who's at maybe the same stage of life and see what they're doing? We walk together on the same road as fellow seekers who are journeying after God. And our presence in church is important because none of us are strong enough to make it on that road alone. At least I'm not. None of us are strong enough to make it on our own power. We depend on the Holy Spirit and the grace of God that is poured out for us through our neighbors. Recall, uh, did Jesus send out his disciples all on their, uh, by themselves one at a time? There we go, two, two at a time, or even in larger groups. No, none of us has all the gifts. None of us has all the knowledge. None of us has all the grace that we need for the day, do we? We need each other to enlighten one another, to love one another, and even at times to hold one another to account, gently watching over one another, correcting people when they go astray, or being with them and lifting them out of trouble when they face it. There may be times in your life when a more mature brother or sister in Christ has to call you to account for something that you're doing. Did you know that? It's not the most fun thing about being a Christian. Has anybody here ever had a a person uh, talk to you 
and say, hey, something that you're doing is, is really brushing this person the wrong way and I, I think you need to change the way that you're handling it? Or has anybody ever said to you, hey, the way that you're talking uh, to that other person doesn't seem very kind or you're being impatient? Or, uh, hey, uh, you're, you're not um, following God the way that you need to be following God in this moment. Has anybody ever had that happen or been on the other side of it? I think in an ideal church, uh, that happens in a gentle way, not in a condemning way. But that's what we're for, you know, to support one another and, and, and reprove one another. Likewise, on the other hand, uh, you might see a friend who is in trouble, who is in turmoil, and you're called to go and be with them in their, their despair. Has anybody ever had that happen? Where you see a person and they look like they're in a, in a boat on their own and the boat's going down and you have to go in there and grab a bucket to, to start getting the water out of the boat. You ever been with somebody through the death of a loved one or through uh, uh, a divorce or through uh, a terrible uh, loss of a job or, or something of that sort. Those things happen to people, right? Church is not about pretending everything's perfect. It's about being present with one another through the good and the bad. You see, we must be present with one another physically, yes, here on Sunday mornings, but also uh, during the week, and also spiritually, mentally, emotionally, to enjoy the gifts and the consolation of the church that we may, as the Apostle Paul said in Romans, rejoice with those who are rejoicing and weep with those who are weeping. You can't do that if you're not with them. And I'm willing to bet that there are some in our congregation today who are here with heavy hearts. I probably, am I off base saying that? I bet there are some who, who are in struggles today. People who maybe need someone to give them a, a hug or, or share a smile or to ask with a sincere heart, how is it with your soul? I encourage you to, to ask that question to a, a fellow church member or to a, a brother or sister in Christ this week, especially if you notice uh, they need someone to talk to. But once again, that relationship is only possible to maintain if we are present with one another, if we're present in worship, in study, in the breaking of the bread at this table back here, it's really hard to go up to somebody and correct them for their behavior if you only see them once every two years, right? Likewise, it's really hard to go and, and say, hey, I'm here with you. Uh, hadn't seen you in, in a while. I would encourage you that it is good to do those things, but it's a lot easier if we're present with one another on a, on a weekly or a regular basis, right? Mm -hmm. Things work out a lot better if we're present with one another. Finally, I want to just emphasize that presence, our vow to be present here in a community, is not about a self-improvement plan. Vowing to be present is not about showing how good we are at uh, getting in a car and driving and sitting down. <laughs> Being present is uh, a realization of how frail all of us are and how very needful we are of Jesus. Vowing to be present is saying um, when you join the church, I know I might be in a good spot right now, but I'm not always going to be, so I pledge to be here for the times that I need it the most. It's about how much we need Jesus and how much we need to be Jesus to one another. I want to share one of my favorite faith communities that I've ever been a part of was a ministry in Durham in which uh, we nurtured friendships between those who uh, had and those who did not have uh, intellectual and developmental disabilities. Uh, and the reason that it was probably my favorite um, faith community is that it was not dictated by uh, a strict agenda. It wasn't beholden to, we got to do this at this time and then accomplish this at this time. Of course, we did have activities. We, we would do fun stuff like go out in the garden together and, and work in the flowers. We'd play bingo together and, 
even sing a little karaoke, and you know I sounded excellent, <laughs> right? <laughs> but my favorite part was none of that. It was the looseness of, of our time together and something that my friend Greg uh, called unstructured time together. Have you ever heard that? Unstructured time together. It's just a, a fancy way of saying sitting around and talking about anything and nothing at all. Uh, sometimes sitting in silence if you were spending time with somebody who was nonverbal. But no matter what, just sitting around and realizing the gift that you have in the presence and friendship of one another. You might have nothing else in common with this other person except for love. And I wonder if some of you might relate to, to that experience or that feeling of just total uh, relaxation and joy. Maybe it's a feeling that you've had as you've stayed till the very end of mom's kitchen talking with a new friend and you basically have to be chased out of the building because they're locking up. Or a feeling you have when you stand in the church parking lot long after the service is over because you're catching up with somebody who's going through a hard time. Or maybe it's having a cup of coffee at a homebound member's house and just enjoying one another. I wonder if any of you have had this feeling that I'm describing, especially at Millbrook, that feeling you get of being able to let your guard down with no agenda. You're not trying to get anything out of this group of people. God help us, it's not a committee meeting. I don't think, but you just enjoy. You pray, you eat. And I want to suggest that that is the kind of presence that we have and should pledge to one another at Millbrook Methodist. To be a Sabbath and a grace and a safe space to one another in a hectic and a busy world because we know we have to be Christ to one another. We know we have to be Christ to one another. And we know that he loves us and lives in us and around us. And despite all the things that we do to try to mess it up, that Jesus' love prevails in the church. So I hope that when you do have a busy day or you have a broken heart, that you are able to be present with God in this congregation, whether that's here in this building or in the midst of your brothers and sisters. I hope that you can invite others to feel God's presence here. Because even as we pledge to be active in our church's ministries through our presence, the truth is that um, even as we bless the church with our presence, even as you bless the church with your presence, each and every one of us is more blessed in what we receive. Amen? Amen. It's like this. Uh, who here loves a good church potluck? Some of you need to go to a church potluck. I love a church potluck. Uh, you may, you've got your favorite thing that you make. What's your favorite thing that you always make for the potluck? Cornbread. Cornbread. Let's talk. Um, uh, green bean casserole, meatloaf, uh, meatballs, uh, lima beans, dessert, my wife says. Um, so imagine you're going, and instead of going and getting from that great big buffet and bringing your plate down with the nice yeast roll and your fried chicken, that you just sit down with a big old plate of green bean casserole, what you brought with you. How enjoyable is that? I mean, maybe if you're hungry for a little bit of green bean casserole. But what I mean here is what we receive from the body, the good gifts that everyone brings and sets before God in this holy place, is a, a gift and, a, and an offering to one another. You are uh, God to one another. We all receive more than we can give because the gift of the body is that we are all here for one another. Our presence is the way that we come into contact with Jesus through potlucks, <laughs> through the preached word, through his body broken for us and his blood poured out for us for the forgiveness of sins and the gift of eternity. And our presence here on Sunday mornings and through the week is how we are drawn more and more into him 
and shaped for our future life with him in the resurrection. And that's the point that I want to end with. Did you know that your presence in church and with your congregation is the way that God is preparing you for heaven? Did you know that? This is heaven practice. Really. Your presence is the means by which God is preparing you for heaven, whether you are eight years old or 80. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Thank you for your presence here today. We don't take it for granted. Thank you for being Jesus to one another and for being Christ to me. Jesus is alive. He's conquered sin and death, and he is here in this room. May we go forth today with a renewed sense of how important it is to gather together and rejoice in his presence. Amen.